Thank you so much. Let me just add my welcome. We have here in the room um, students from the School of Media and Public Affairs, students from our university writing program, students from elsewhere on campus. We have faculty, we have some of our librarian partners with our writing program, and we have members of the um, Federal Grand Lodge here in Washington and greater Washington area, as well as um, others who have seen our posters on campus and been drawn to the possibility here of a well-reasoned public discourse. I want to start by giving particular thanks to the Justice Columbian Lodge Number no. 3 that started this by giving a gift to our university writing program for student prizes writing on ethics. And as that played out, as the first round of prizes played out, the conversations between our writing program and the Lodge realized that there was a real mutual interest there in promoting and supporting ethical, informed, well-reasoned public discourse. This is something that the world needs more of. Clearly, the world needs more of. So this is a kickoff event for, as, as was indicated, a series in honor of the 20, 200th anniversary of the Federal Grand Lodge. And this partnership tonight between the Freemasons and George Washington University University Writing Program and our School of Media Public Affairs is part of what we like doing here at George Washington University. We are in and of DC. We are engaging Washington and the world. And these partnerships and these conversations give, give um, embodiment, really, to those ideas that we have. We're both um, interested from our community partner side and from our GW side in supporting this kind of conversation, in supporting this kind of initiative, and thinking about where this might take us. And in fact, the idea for Columbian College came from George Washington himself, who was interested in bringing young people to the capital city to create a national identity, to bring young people and to educate them in arts, literature, government, science, and we're still doing that today in Columbian College of Arts and Sciences, and we're pleased from that perspective to be one of the sponsors of our conversation here tonight. Tonight's panel is going to be moderated by Professor Derek Malone France, who's the Interim Executive Director of the University Writing Program and a faculty member in Department of Religion. Derek, would you like to introduce our panelists? Thank you so much. Thank you, Peggy. Uh, thank you all. <laughs> we really appreciate you being here tonight. The event is also being streamed live on CCAS's uh, website, and uh, we're going to archive it online at SMPA's YouTube channel and uh, the New York Times Knowledge Channel website, so that a larger audience even than can be physically present here is going to get to uh, benefit from uh, what our panelists have to say. Uh, I'll introduce the panelists first. Uh, we've got Bud Ward, who is the director of the Yale Forum on Climate Change and the Media. Mindy Finn, who is the former chief strategist for e-strategy for the Romney presidential campaign and a founding partner of Engage Communications. Bob Herbert, New York Times columnist and professional fellow at SMPA and Al May, former uh, politics editor for the Atlanta Journal-Constitution and a professor in the School of Media and Public Affairs as well. I'm going to start by inviting each of the panelists to make about a five-minute opening statement about the particular area of democracy and public argument, the broader theme uh, that they're here specifically to address. And from there, I'll try and facilitate a conversation that allows them actually to jump out of the box of uh, the uh, particular sub-theme that we've given them and hopefully um, actually exchange ideas with one another and uh, just develop an organic conversation. So, uh, Bud, perhaps I'll get you to start. Okay. Why don't you stay here? Okay. <coughs> Thank you, Derek. Uh, it's nice to be here. I heard a couple opening phrases from the, the two individuals who made opening remarks. Uh, open a need for an open and civilized debate, a well-reasoned public discourse. The third one was an ethical, well-reasoned uh, public discourse. And I'm thinking I'm here to talk to you about science communication, science understanding, and in particular, climate change science communication. And certainly each of those is badly needed in the area of um, cl climate science communication, public understanding. And let me start by saying that um, there is a well-established 
body of peer-reviewed scientific evidence um, on two, two points relative to climate change or climate change science. The two points are fairly simply stated. One, Earth is warming, and two, humans are significant contributors to that warming. Now, beyond that, everything else is up for grabs. All the policy issues are up for grabs. Much of the other remaining science is up for grabs. Uh, but on those two points, Earth is warming, and substantially because of human activities, uh, substantially, not the sole cause, but substantial contributor. So those are uh, two areas uh, where there is strong uh, body of scientific evidence from multiple different um, um, uh, uh, scientific specialties. Now, in terms of communicating those, uh, the, the scientific understanding of climate change, um, I think we have, in, in effect, a perfect storm. Um, the issue is a conundrum in terms of communications challenges. <clears throat> the role of the social sciences is critical here and uh, still emerging uh, after the earth scientists have taken it to a certain point. And I want to indicate just a few reasons why this is such a challenge for communicators and therefore for the public in coming to understand uh, the opportunities and the challenges that uh, societies face in a, 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 in a, a changing climate. Uh, one of the challenges is that there's a perception, and there's some truth to this, there's a perception that we will incur costs now for benefits that will accrue only to future generations. There's some, cre some credibility, some evidence to support that. So our generation today is going to incur the costs and expenses for benefits that our grandkids and their grandkids will realize. So that's one of the challenges in communicating this in a democratic society. Another is that there clearly will be some winners. There will clearly will be some areas of benefit from a warmer world. Most of the results, most of the impacts are likely not to be beneficial, or thought not to be beneficial, but there clearly will be areas of winners as well as losers. So that adds to the communication challenge, the public understanding challenge. A third bullet point. The impacts of climate change are not going to be linear. By that, I mean we are going to continue to have weather while we have climate change. Just because we have climate change doesn't mean we won't have weather. We will. <laughs> so we're going, to have, we're going to have cold Augusts and warm Januaries into the future. We're going to have those weather anomalies. The distinction between weather and climate is critical here. We always say that climate informs us for what wardrobe to buy. Weather informs us for what to wear that day. If we can keep that distinction in mind, it's an important distinction that the public has to come to understand. Just because it's a warm January in Washington or a cool July in Washington has nothing to do with climate. That's weather, not climate. So that's an important distinction that frequently is uh, lost. I think any public policy issue, any social issue would kill to have some of the iconic figures that climate change has. Think of the polar bear and think of melting glaciers. Those are great iconic symbols for climate change to have, but they're double-edged sword because they tell the public that the impacts are far away and distant. They're distant in time because the benefits will accrue in, in future generations, and they're distant in space because I'm never going to see a polar bear in the wild, quite possibly, or I'm never going to see that melting glacier. So there's a, they create the impression that the, that the issue is distant and far away, both in space and time, and that adds to the problem. Science clearly is not a game of popularity. It is not determined by consensus. Science is determined by evidence. And that is a challenge in communicating to the public. Because one only need to say in a sound bite on television or in the, in the media age that uh, science is uncertain. Climate science is uncertain. Of course it's uncertain. That's what's good about science. It's going to stay uncertain. It's never going to be bulletproof. The sun may rise in the west tomorrow. But as far as we know, it's going to rise in the east until it does differently. So there's scientific evidence and not consensus 
is what drives the strong opinion among many climate scientists that there's a legitimate issue here. Finally, another point. Uncertainty is a virtue of the best science. The best scientists embrace uncertainty, they flaunt it, they brag about it. It's a virtue of the best science. For the advocacy communities, it's not. When was the last time you heard an advocate point to all the uncertainties in their arguments or their position? They don't. But the scientists embrace uncertainty. The public needs to understand that. The other thing the public needs to understand in this context is this. Uncertainty cuts both ways. It might mean that we're overstating the impacts of climate change. It might mean that we're understating the impacts of climate change. So uncertainty does not necessarily mean that it's not a problem. Uncertainty may mean it might be a bigger problem than we currently understand. Finally, there are going to be um, win-win approaches on climate change. There are going to be win-win solutions. These are in the policy area, and all that's up for grabs. The debate's by no means settled, as you've seen uh, from just the past six or eight months in this city. Um, but there are going to be win-win solutions. But as a bottom line, when it comes to science, scientists need to understand this. Science alone is not going to drive this decision, this public policy decision. It's one element in the public's understanding of this and other uh, policy-related scientific issues. But science alone is not going to carry the day on its own. There are going to be other factors, political preferences, religious preferences, sociological offering, all sorts of factors are going to filter in to the final decision. So the science has to play its role to the hilt, but there are lots of other major actors in that, in that play. Science is just one. Thank you. Thank you, bud. Mindy? Thank you, Derek. <clears throat> I'm going to talk about a different kind of change, and that's disruptive change in the fields of media, politics, and government due to innovations, namely with the internet and, and mobile. I asked the audience a question. How many of you have a Facebook page, use Facebook? OK, about 80%. How many of you did so five years ago? About 10%. How many of you did so 10 years ago? That's clearly a trick question because it didn't exist. And today, we have 300, more than 300 million Americans who are using a social network called Facebook. We had a film made about this social network uh, that was nominated for an Academy Award, and we have its CEO being named Time Person of the Year, the richest, youngest, richest billion, youngest billionaire um, ever. He's right at the age of 26. This has impacted media, politics, and government in a major, major way. I've been working in this field for 10 years. I was fortunate because of my age to be entering the field at a time when this disruptive change, the impact was first being felt. And the, the biggest breakthrough moment that some in this room certainly will remember and some may not was in 2003 when Howard Dean, it looked, at, looked like Governor Howard Dean was going to be the nominee for the Democratic Party in 2004, um, despite everybody's expectation that it would be John Kerry. We all know what happened. It ended up being Senator John Kerry instead of Howard Dean due to some slips and, and mistakes that the Governor Howard Dean made. Um, but it was clearly the, the ability for individuals, the people, not the powerful, to use the internet in disruptive ways to propel their preferred candidate to a position of power. And it was not all for naught in that their preferred candidate went on to be chairman of the Democratic National Committee, the most, one of the more powerful roles in the party. And many of those young staff members and, and frankly technologists who built tools to empower people to organize for Howard Dean went on to better those tools in the years following and applied those tools to another candidate in 2007, and that was Senator, now President, Barack Obama. There's terms that are thrown around a lot in discussing this phenomenon. Uh, you'll hear terms such as the, the blogosphere, the going back to 2002 and 2004, 
which described individuals who were blogging, supposedly from their basement in their pajamas, who were making, uh, who were, were causing even um, the top, top uh, broadcasters at a major network to be fired for being exposed for using uh, fake documentation and going after the sitting president. And of course, that was Dan Rather. Uh, it was a blogger, actually, a right of center blogger who knew a lot about fonts. Who would think that you know something about fonts, typography, and that could lead to a major network uh, broadcaster uh, being, being fired in a huge scandal because they happened to notice that the font that was used in those documents didn't exist back in the 70s when the document was supposed to come, or when the document was, uh, was, was originated. Um, this blogosphere uh, has, it's, it has, has advanced and has come to be called the Digerati and um, the Twitterati and now even the, um, the, uh, the word is um, the fifth estate, excuse me. The fifth estate is a, is a word that's, that's thrown around a lot to talk about, of course, the fourth estate, besides the three major branches of government, is the press and the fifth estate is the people who are now their own powerful media. You hear the term citizen media. Now they, they talk about them as influentials in marketing. But it's really all the same people. It's this idea that, uh, that individuals, the people, not the powerful, have more control over the forces of government and the forces of politics than ever before. And of course, we've seen evidence of this. In 2007, not even the most respected pundits um, would would have said or would have predicted that Barack Obama would have been the nominee for president. Even when he won the first two critical primaries, many said this was not possible. And of course, there was the reaction by his biggest opponent, Senator Hillary Clinton and her staff, who Hillary's uh, top media consultant was quoted after a, a major dinner in Iowa before the Iowa primary, the Jefferson Jackson dinner. Was, was asked by a reporter, how do, you, how do you feel about the huge turnout that Barack Obama has here tonight? Does this concern your campaign? And Mandy Grunwald, Hillary Clinton's top media advisor, said, no, it doesn't concern us. Um, our voters look like caucus voters. These voters look like they're, these individuals look like they're barely old enough to vote. They look like Facebook and kind of brushed it off. And we know what ended up happening in that those young voters, <clears throat> And these individuals who were clamoring for change, as we remember, showed up and ultimately propelled their candidate to win the Iowa caucus. Even after the winning in Iowa and in New Hampshire, not many believed that Barack Obama would, would actually go on to win. And of course, there were several reasons for that. One was his um, little experience. Um, one was that the, the Clintons were the, the party machine, and it was hard to believe that the people could disrupt the powerful and the forces of power through, frankly, free expression through the internet um, that became, that spread like a virus and, and propelled them to organize. Many did not believe that could be the case. Um, clearly it was, and, and we all know the result. In 2009 and 2010, there was another, uh, there, there was little bursts of evidence of how the people are disrupting the powerful across the country. And it's one that only recently have um, journalists and scholars started to write about the similarities between this phenomenon and the change, the call for change in 2007 and 2008, and that was the, the Tea Party movement across the country. Many people, and we're talking about civility and argument, I'm sure would talk about the lack of civility potentially in that, um, in that movement. However, the, the desires by those who were organizing was very similar to the change movement in 2007. If you go back and you look at the, at the discourse and the analysis on the discourse and that they wanted to be heard. They wanted to feel that their government was responsive to them and was working for them, was working for the people, not for the powerful. So I would, I would leave with this point um, and I look forward to the discussion, which is there, I've been part of a kind of personal democracy forum movement for the last uh, six years, which is predicated on the idea that the, the internet is a force for democracy <coughs> and that an internet is a force for freedom. And in and, and understanding that, that the internet is a positive force in, for society. 
And I think we certainly know it's a disruptive force. We've seen that um, most recently in Tunisia and Egypt and, and Libya. Um, we know it and we've seen it in our own country and in a bit of a more muted way when you compare it to, to those movements with the Obama movement and the Tea Party movement. So we know it's a disruptive force. I think the, I still tend to believe that at the end of the day, giving more people access to freely express themselves is a positive, but it certainly has caused, has certainly led to a more polarizing society as well. So I think the jury is still out, whether it is a force for positive or it's, it, it's a force for good or it's a force for evil. Um, but I, I would also like to introduce today, and this is something that I, I tweeted speaking of Twitter, which is we talk about new media and we talk about digital media and we talk about internet media and we talk about e-media and some people say this is direct media because you can communicate directly with people through a social network. I think a better term for it is open media because it's, it's throwing open the ability for everyone to be their own publisher, to freely express themselves and to, be, uh, and to make it and have a disruptive impact on government and politics and other aspects of our society. Thank you, Mindy. And Bob? You know, when um, we're talking about open and civilized debate, <clears throat> it seems to me that when you're talking about issues of race, we have neither an open nor a civilized debate. Um, generally, on racial issues, we veer from one extreme to the other. Either there's hysteria out there or there's silence. Um, the hysteria, you, you know, there are examples that quickly come to mind. One was the hysteria over Barack Obama's pastor, Jeremiah Wright, the idea that that story was blown so vastly out of proportion it seemed incredible to me, and the presidential candidate had to go make a major speech on race to get his campaign back on track. Um, another example was after Obama was elected, the Skip Gates fiasco, where um, Henry Louis Gates Jr., the Harvard professor, was arrested inside his home, his own home, where he was doing nothing wrong. Um, it took only six minutes from the time the call was um, the um, call was made that someone suspected that there had been a burglary at the house to the time when um, Professor Gates was being taken out of his home in handcuffs, which is bizarre. Uh, that would never have happened with a white professor at Harvard or any other major university in, in my view. But the point is that, again, the story became um, sort of part of, a, it, was, it was like national hysteria and people lined up on one side or the other. Either they were um, pro-Gates and it was an outrage what had happened to him or he deserved what he got, and he was a loud mouth, this, that, and the other thing. And once again, the President of the United States, I mean, he made a comment and said the police had acted stupidly. And then, they, you know, then the attack came on Obama, and the next thing you know, they're having this beer fest down here in, in uh, Washington, which I thought was both um, absurd and humiliating. So you get the, these kind of hysterical outbursts on race issues, but then you have the flip side. And that is that on a lot of very serious issues that have to do with race, we don't hear anything. Uh, one example of that would be what has happened um, to blacks in this recession. I mean, there's been all kinds of coverage of the economic downturn, the Great Recession, and that sort of thing. But the people who have been hurt worst in this recession are the people at the lower end of the socioeconomic scale, and it has um, disproportionately hurt black Americans. It's hurt black Americans more than anyone else. But you never hear a discussion of this um, on television or in the radio, in, in, on, the, on the radio. You don't read much about it in the newspapers or the news magazines and that sort of thing. That's off the table. Uh, I've written a lot of columns about uh, young black and Hispanic um, males, mostly in New York City, who are the focus of what they call the stop and frisk program in, in New York City. In New York City, the police make from half a million to 600 
thousand stops on the street. Uh, sometimes, uh, in many cases, these individuals are also frisked. They're made to spread eagle on the hood of cars or uh, spread their arms up against the wall or lie in a humiliating fashion face down in the streets. And they're searched, they're frisked to see if they're carrying, allegedly carrying a weapon. 90%, almost 90% of the time, they've done absolutely nothing wrong. They're not arrested. Summonses are not issued. And yet this goes on year after year after year. It does not happen um, with anywhere near the same frequency um, with white youngsters, but only with black and Latino youngsters. And if they're innocent, my question is, why are they being stopped again and again and again, year after year after year? Um, you don't see much coverage of this. Uh, in public, you don't see much of a uh, debate, civilized or otherwise, about this. I went out to Chicago uh, a few years ago to cover um, these youngsters that were being shot, public school youngsters, not, not shot on public school grounds, just shot in the city of Chicago. And there were extraordinary numbers. If I'm not mistaken, the numbers would be like over the course of a school year, something like 150 kids would be shot. Um, maybe, you know, um, a couple of dozen fatally. And um, it would seem to me that that should be a, um, a huge national story. And yet it's not. I mentioned in the column that um, Anderson Cooper went out there and uh, did some stories on it, and I um, acknowledged CNN's coverage of it. But other than that, no coverage. You our schools, I've mentioned this in a column very recently, are as segregated now as ever. The Brown versus Board of Education uh, ruling outlawing legal uh, segregation was in 1954. It's almost 60 years ago. And yet, you know, we hear all this talk about, oh, we have to get these kids educated. Um, we've got this program, we've got that program. But the one thing that they won't do the one thing that they won't do is move these youngsters who are ghettoized, who are the victims of housing discrimination, who do not have much in the way of um, family income. Um, what they will not do is integrate these kids into the larger society so that they get the benefit of better schools with better teachers, better facilities, peers, who have higher expectations, who are more um, committed to learning in school. These are all the benefits that make, it, that make a difference. And I'll give you an example of how it makes a difference. If you have, there's a, there's a gap between the, the uh, uh, scholastic achievement of poor black and Latinos on the one hand and poor white kids on the other. When the, research, when the researchers do the analysis, what they find is that the poor white kids tend to go to middle class schools, whereas the poor black and Latino kids tend to go to schools where there are enormous concentrations of poverty. Teachers shun those schools. There's not as much parental involvement, which by the way is an important issue, and I've written about that too. Parents, uh, black and Latino parents should be more involved in their children's education um, than they are. But the fact of the matter is the quality of the schools and the quality of the, of the education in schools where there are concentrations of poverty are not as good as in schools where there is more of a um, middle class environment. And what, you, what, what the studies have shown is that if you can integrate these youngsters into schools where um, economically there is, a, there is a higher standard, standard, what you get is a higher standard, standard of, academic, of academic achievement. So my point is that we need to get to a place where however you feel about the specific issues, where you can have a reasonable discussion of racial issues that are important and significant not just to blacks or not just to Latinos, but I think to all Americans where you can have a reasonable discussion, where people can reasonably agree or disagree. I think the phrase President Obama uses is, uh, we can disagree without being disagreeable. 
We need to get to that place, and we need to get away from the place where the only racial issue, only racial stories that we pay attention to are the ones that sort of uh, foment this um, national hysteria of which you don't, you don't get to any kind of uh, substantive conclusion as a result of it. One final point is, you know, the president made his speech after the Jeremiah Wright fiasco, and he was widely praised for this very reasonable speech on race in the United States of America. But even the president of the United States speaks very seldom about race. You won't hear President Obama talking about black people very often. Uh, there's not a great deal of talk about poverty in the administration. There's actually um, a task force on the middle class in uh, Vice President Biden's office. Uh, but where's our task force on the poor? Uh, where is the help designated for the people who are being hurt worst in this long, long economic downturn? We need to bring these issues out into the open and have much more of a discussion of these issues. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bob. Al? Thank you. <clears throat> um, yesterday, a colleague uh, came in my office and had seen me on this program, and he said, uh, what do you know about civility? <laughs> You're a journalist. And I thought about that. Uh, if we have this, we have, we have a massive rush of civility, there's going to be some starving journalists in America. Uh, I, th I, I don't think it's a high risk. Um, and, 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 and it kind of fits what I wanted to kind of talk about in terms of the, me the media age that we're in and these discussions from the Jeremiah Wright to the the, the questions about the, the, that have become so much part of our politics and so much part of our media. Uh, and I guess my point is that we have moved into an age of, of significant polarization in our media and not only in, um, among journalists but among the audiences that select what they are going to watch, read, or listen to. Um, and I think of all the, you know, of all the changes that we've seen in our media, and there are many, uh, this one is the, maybe the most important. Uh, it's not that a polarization in our media is new in America, it's not. Uh, we uh, spent most of the 19th century uh, where Americans chose their newspaper, which was the media of the day, uh, based on its political allegiance. Uh, we, ha we moved from that uh, to a gradual uh, independence of media from partisanship and from at least uh, direct political parties in the really, really uh, a window that really didn't begin until the second half of the 20th century uh, in which the norm became that an American journalist or even audiences, for a variety of reasons, uh, felt that there, were, there should be a detachment from party and there should be a detachment uh, from uh, overt ideology in our media. For the last 15 years, we've had an interesting debate about that norm, that norm that, that dominated the second half of the 20th century and in, in, in those 15 years, it's been partly technological driven and it's also been sociologically driven. Uh, but in the last, it, a lot of people forget uh, that the current media system that we're now in really was born in the mid 1990s, which is when we had the emergence of talk. Uh, we had cable television, we'd been, been around for another 15 years before that. But we had the first really emergence of uh, cable talk in, in, with a significant partisan uh, flavor to it, which of course is Fox News. Uh, later, MSNBC has kind of uh, uh, gravitated that way. And at the same time, that's when the internet came along. 
Uh, and I think oftentimes we forget that those two occurrences in our media occurred side by side, uh, starting in the mid-90s and through uh, today. Um, and what's happened is that we have reemerged some of the old issues that dominated, well, the 19th century. Uh, and this notion of where a journalist is or where an audience is uh, has reemerged, I think, is an important issue of thinking about how media uh, shapes our politics. And, uh, and I mean, I'll just give you a couple examples. We're, we're all quite familiar with the role of cable t television and cable talk uh, in, early on. Uh, you can look at it from the, you know, and you could blame Fox, uh, which uh, came along in 1996. Fox has now an audience, it's the largest cable uh, uh, audience. Uh, it has, uh, in some very interesting polling done last year, 40% of Republicans in America watch Fox on a regular basis. 15% of Democrats watch Fox on a regular basis. That wasn't true eight years ago. This gap, it, 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 at the time, in, in, in eight years ago, is when Fox became the dominant uh, cable channel. Um, and it had a bipartisan audience. So in the last eight years, the gap has widened. The same is true for the other cables. Uh, you can look at uh, the latest polling that shows that uh, CNN uh, had about 25% about of Democrats in America watched uh, CNN regularly, uh, and that number dropped to about 12% of Republicans. And it was about two to one on MSNBC. Well, the point is that it's not just the cables. Um, the, the polarization across our media selection by audience, who do you, who, who do you want to watch, who do, you, who do you trust, has, at least in, 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 the, in the last few years, shown itself to be across the media spectrum. Uh, and there's some really interesting uh, polling been done by the Pew uh, Research Center. And uh, last year, they did a very interesting, uh, very deep poll on uh, how Americans consume news. And you would expect, as they did, they predicted that you would see on the right, you would have the Rush Limbaugh's and the Fox, uh, Hannity, O'Reilly talk shows would be on one end of the scale, and then on the other end of the scale, as you would expect, would be <coughs> Rachel Maddow and, at the time, uh, Keith Olbermann, who no longer is in, at MS, MSNBC. And so you had this kind of stratification that you would fully expect. What was fascinating to me about it, and looking at the data is, actually, uh, all these media institutions, both news organizations and generic did a very interesting look at about 24 of them across the scale, and they scale across this diversity, this, this uh, polarization uh, tracks, so that, uh, for example, when you look at an organization you wouldn't think wouldn't be uh, an overt partisan organization, and, and, and famously this is, it's been in the news, the, uh, NPR. NPR, uh, according to the survey, showed that about 14% of its audience were Republicans, 40% were Democrats, and the rest were independents. A similar scale on ideologically conservative, moderate, that sort of thing. Well, that's interesting, and that's <laughs> certainly part of the reason why the, the House Republicans felt that they had the political base to defund NPR, but if you look at Rush Limbaugh, okay, and look at his profile, 10% of his audience are Democrats. Well, a lot different than NPR. 63% of his audience are Republicans, and the rest of them are moderates. So here you have Rush Limbaugh, and here you have NPR, 
and they have a similar political profile, just reversed, all right? But they're very different. They're very different media. They're both radio, okay? Uh, so why would, why would Limbaugh is an overt partisan, makes no bones about it. NPR is not an overt partisan. Um, while the, the, the right has long felt that NPR was to the left, and you know, they have some argument. Americans seem to perceive NPR almost kind of in the reverse way as they perceive Rush Limbaugh. So that suggests to me that there's more playing here than commentary, because NPR, by the way, doesn't you know, even do much commentary. So why are Americans segregating themselves in these ways in their media selection? Well, we really don't know the answer to that. There are some arguments, scholars are divided, that we've turned ourselves, we've, we've, because of the internet, because of cable, because of the fragmentation of our media, we've turned ourselves in kind of gated communities. And everybody knows what a gated community is, right? Where we, we hear all the same thing, we talk to the same people, and the more we hear from the same people, the more we agree with those people, and the more polarized we become. There are others who argue that now the data doesn't support this kind of ghettoization of our media, and that we are not, and then in fact, there are more varieties of information sources than there have ever been. There's a kind of a third school that says it's a little more sophisticated than that. And one of the really interesting, uh, some of the interesting scholarship that's been done on this, it looks at and says, what's happened really is we've had a lot of Americans drop out of consumption of news and politics. They've moved to entertainment channels. They've moved away from this. Who's left are the most interested and activist members of the consuming public for news about politics. They tend to be more parse. They tend to be more polarized. So, and I'm kind of part of that third school, but you can't blame this all on the media because the media is an elite that's reflecting what's going on in the larger society. And the larger society is polarizing. In the last 30 years, a lot of the data shows that we have what, what one author wrote a very interesting book called The Great Sort, which means we move and we live in different communities. So that today, where you live probably def defines your politics what your religious commitment is defines your politics. Whether you're married or you're single defines your politics. Your age <coughs> defines your politics. So we've had this division in the society reflected by the media. And so what are the consequences? Well, I think they're mixed. On one hand, we've always had a robust debate in America and this debate is no more violent or, or, or rowdy than it was in the 19th century. We sort of got used to a little milder, more civil discourse, but we're kind of back to a little rough, rough exchange. The difficulty, of course, it is that it makes it very difficult to reach shared views to govern. And so we see ourselves quite locked up in a failure to reach consensus in our, uh, uh, our governance like the Congress. Uh, so it's an interesting uh, new digital age and a new, new medium age, and it's largely on your shoulders to figure out how you will weather it. It's not, and again, uh, I'm not necessarily in favor of civility, but I, I, I don't <laughs> want to talk about it. Thank you, Al. <laughs> I'd like to... Um, pick up actually on Al's comments and, and Mindy um, give you a chance to weigh in on this uh, as well. Um, it's, it's interesting to think about 
um, the, the evolution that occurred in the norms, the sort of ethical norms that governed journalism in the United States over time. And as you mentioned, um, we gradually moved towards a, a more civil and maybe in some cases a more gentle, even not terribly robust form of journalistic inquiry in certain ways, but also in ways that maybe we um, would like to get back, it, it was more civil. Uh, and, and then to think about going back to the blogosphere, you know, there are a couple of examples recently uh, that we can point to. There was a liberal uh, radio host who prank called the Wisconsin governor and pretended to be someone he wasn't, right, to elicit a certain kind of response. Very similarly, you had uh, the sort of guerrilla journalism of uh, the people going to the NPR uh, uh, person and, and pretending to be donors of a certain kind. And it, it, you know, you think about it as a kind of citizen journalism that is without the sort of ethics that guide uh, institutionalized journalism where, for example, you know, it's not that no one will ever uh, be incognito, but it's a kind of last resort technique. And I, and I wonder if you think it's possible that that same sort of evolution that took place in institutionalized journalism where an ethical code of a sort developed, can that happen in the blogosphere? Or is it too radically um, grassroots for there to be that sort of consensus that builds up? I think it's possible that an ethical code will develop, but it will be different, take a different form than what we have seen in the past in, in journalism. You know, the, it's much more organic, as you mentioned, and I think this, this actually drives some of the extreme discourse in even the more, what would be considered more traditional media, like the MSNBCs or some of the individuals who have their own shows on Fox, because everybody, there's so much competition for attention that journalism has become extremely sensational because you have to shout the loudest or say, the, say something that's the most extreme in order to get attention. And so you see these bloggers taking these, I guess by many would be considered extreme tactics to get a story that, that nobody else would just to get seen and heard and to, to make a name for themselves and to make, um, and to, to create a story that, that nobody else is doing. I, I think some on the other hand though would argue that um, with the many sources and diverse sources of media that we have now, because there is such a, a low barrier to, to be the media, um, that um, it's an opportunity to expose stories that, that couldn't be exposed otherwise. Clearly there's a line that, there, there is a line, the question is where is that line? I think most of people in this room probably think those bloggers in question that you mentioned cr cross that line. I think it, you know there is nothing to stop them from doing that, but if they don't get readership and they don't get attention and they don't get hired and they're called out within the media, then it's an organic code starts to develop. Maybe it's not a formal code, but it is one um, that's kind of developed by, by force and by people not listening to them, which was their original intent. Can I make a point? I'm going to uh, be a little harsher on the uh, media, and I'm talking mainstream media, um, uh, television and um, radio and uh, newspapers, I think, to a lesser extent, because newspapers are just getting um, bashed out of business for the most part. Um, but I think that um, we have not really tried to foster reason debate of complex issues um, in the media landscape that has um, emerged in the past several years. Um, you know, television has become, and this is not new for the longest time, all about uh, ratings. We're in a sound bite culture. Um, you know, sensationalism is what draws the most attention and that's where, you know, you get the people looking at the advertising and spending the money and, and all of that sort of thing. Um, I'm not sure I know what the answer to this is, but I think that Americans in general are more thoughtful than many of us in the media give them credit for being. I think that they're, as I go around the country, 
I think that there's a real hunger for a robust but civil debate on the important issues of the day. And for all the talk about you know, the internet and what goes on in the blogosphere and stuff like that, I think the vast majority of Americans are, are absolutely frozen out of the debate on the main issues facing this country. And the fact that you can take a poll and say, well, you know, 57% of Americans are in favor of this, or 42% uh, are opposed, um, that's not satisfactory to me. In the first place, you're only measuring respondents, but it's also respondents who, in many cases, are not particularly well informed. So, what's going on in Libya right now? Uh, what voice did most Americans have? And, and I'm not taking a position on this uh, for, the, for the sake of um, our, our meeting here tonight, but what kind of a voice did Americans have in terms of our policies in, uh, in uh, Libya? Uh, what kind of a voice do Americans have on whether we ought to stay or not stay in Afghanistan or Iraq uh, on really how um, budget issues ought to be handled in this country. Um, most of the Americans I talk to are concerned primarily about economic issues and especially jobs. Um, people are concerned about the cost of a college education and the high amounts of debt that their kids are coming out of school with and the kids' difficulty in finding uh, gainful employment and that sort of thing. But they don't really have a way of engaging. Of course, they can vote. We're a free society in that sense but they don't really have a, uh, an opportunity to engage in a debate where you hear really a variety of ideas and where you can make your feelings known, where you may have ideas and that sort of thing. And I think it's a great irony that the media have opened up to the extent that it has, that so many people you would think um, would have a voice now because of uh, Facebook and the internet and, and all the other electronic uh, media and that sort of thing. But I feel that it's just the opposite. And I think that's the reason so many Americans are tuning out. They don't really feel they're getting that much from Fox or from MSNBC or from the nightly network news. And I really think that at a wonderful school like this, and I think thoughtful journalists, wherever they might be, in television, radio, newspapers, or whatever, need to start thinking about how to open up the debate so that we hear more voices, reasoned voices, that we hear more ideas, and that those ideas can be uh, exchanged. It raises a, a, another sort of fundamental issue, and I'm, I'm gonna tie this back, Bud, to what you were talking about, this idea of uh, being an informed citizen, um, we're talking about argument and the nature of democracy. And you, you, Bud, talked about the difference between evidence-based and advocacy-based reasoning. And of course, that's inseparably related to uh, the difference between um, being an amateur and being an expert. Uh, and so when you think about democracy, there is a certain tension between the value of democratic decision-making and the value of expertise. So, um, you know, uh, I think as Oscar Wilde's supposed to have said, uh, I'm gonna paraphrase him and put it in terms of citizens instead of people, the least informed are cocksure and the most informed are full of doubt, right? And uh, I'll tie this back to what we do in the university writing program because one of the hardest things that we try and do is have students simultaneously hold two contradictory things in their head. That they should be able to go out and learn something about a subject and then project authority when they write a paper about it but at the same time that they should be able to recognize that the level of expertise they've developed is minuscule compared to the level of expertise they would need to develop if they were truly to be an expert on that subject. And it seems to me in some ways that's the place of the democratic citizen, right? The more we know about a particular issue, the more we know that we don't know much about it unless we are really an expert. So I, I don't know exactly how that weighs in terms of your thinking about things like the, the arguments over climate change, but I wonder if you have any thoughts. Well, I was talking with one of the guests earlier <clears throat> earlier tonight about um, the potential applicability of the scientific method and evidence-based uh, reasoning uh, to news writing and to journalism. Uh, one of the stellar books in the field when I was uh, a young undergraduate was uh, Precision Journalism by Phil Meyer, University of North Carolina. 
uh, who has since then, since 76 or 78, when he wrote that book, been a champion of bringing uh, the scientific method uh, more into newsrooms. Um, it's a telling commentary that Phil, in 2007, I guess it was, uh, wrote a book called The Vanishing Newspaper, uh, playing to the point that Bob mentioned about uh, what's happening to our major metropolitan daily newspapers and so the mainstream news uh, organizations. I had two thoughts. Uh, one kind of goes back to something that Mindy said. Uh, I liked her comment about the fifth estate, and I certainly agree that uh, that is a boom for uh, democracy and for informed decision making. My concern is that as the power and uh, importance of the fifth estate rises, that of the fourth estate is shrinking. And um, I would like to see, uh, as much as we see great value in the quantity of what the, the blogosphere or whatever you want to call it, uh, 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 provides to us. Um, I'd like to see more uh, evidence of fact-based opinion making. And I think the demise of mainstream journalism, that's a little bit of an overstatement, <coughs> but the shrinking of, of mainstream uh, journalism is a uh, real problem in terms of providing the facts that we need to make informed opinions, informed judgments. So as much as I celebrate the rise of the fifth estate, I'm still concerned about the shrinkage of the fourth estate. On the ethics question, uh, Derek, I'd just like to say that um, I think there's, there has been for decades uh, major changes in journalism ethics as it's applied uh, in the, the print world of, of mainstream journalism, which is my background, uh, as opposed to the broadcast uh, area. Two different sets of, journal of ethical principles in the journalism of both. I think that um, the ethics, however, of both have changed. Uh, the ethics of, of mainstream news organizations, I think, have changed. And frankly, I think they've changed for the worse in the past several decades. I think that ethics is the first victim. Uh, traditional mainstream ink in the veins journalistic ethics is one of the first victims of this move we're seeing uh, to the internet as the digital age. Uh, having said that, Keep in mind that we're at the very beginning of a decades-long evolution of the news media and how we get our information in a democratic society. So it's not too late. Uh, we're in the uh, embryonic stages of what's going to be a four or five decade long evolution in, uh, in, in news and journalism and information sharing in our society. I would just make a comment that <clears throat> We are truly in the information age, and the last decade we've seen a vast increase in not only the amount of information, but access to information. And that's, uh, that's, that led to the rise of the fifth estate that we discuss. If you look at uh, the fastest growing sites on the internet, say some, something like Google, for example, its mission statement is providing information to the world that's used, in, in a, provide making information accessible to the world, useful and accessible to the world. The, the challenge, I think, is that as we have increased information, and we are all publishers, and we do have the fifth estate, and we have, there's citizen media, and we're all the media in a way. I could challenge everyone to read the book, We the Media. It's, it's, a, it's a really fantastic book about this phenomenon. That the, the next phase, so I like to say we spent the last de decade talking about content and the excitement around being our own publishers and creating content, and we need to spend the next decade focused on filters. And how do we filter this content? How do we make it relevant, um, even as individuals, becoming our own personal filter in a way that, that does allow us to be more informed and does allow us to uh, go on a, a diet of sorts of focusing on what's, what's good for us as opposed to what's bad. Um, a friend of mine, I'll, I'll steal this from him, actually runs a blog that I think is based on a, a really brilliant idea. The blog is called Info Vegan. And the, the point being that taking all of the, the, the junk, for lack of a better term, out of the information that we consume and focusing on the healthy information. And that's, that's obviously easier said than done for all the reasons that we're discussing on this panel. And in fact, that individual I, it, I know is writing, um, I think will be writing a book on that, on that similar topic, so I look forward to it. But I truly believe that the last decade was the rise of content, was the rise of information, and the next dec decade will be the rise on smart filtering. Having picked that thread up and wound around a bit from you, Al, maybe I can give you the last word on that. 
Smart okay. filtering. Hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it really, it, well, that goes to, the, uh, I, I guess filtering means uh, sorting out the good from the bad and the reliable, which in an unmediated society becomes the responsibility of a citizen, the fifth estate, which I'm a little skeptical about. Uh, the wisdom of the mob, which is often uh, cited as the reason how we can self-correct uh, and uh, the bad stuff goes down and the good stuff rises up, interesting in theory. Um, but I do believe that mediated uh, communication is going to remain vigorous and strong and certainly the polls show that Americans are, con are concerned about uh, the quality of the information that they're receiving in this explosion of information and do struggle uh, with who to believe. And without strong gatekeepers or strong mediated communication, uh, they're left to their own devices, and oftentimes that those devices of their own political prejudices or personal prejudices that drive them to sources that just reinforce those uh, prejudices. So I, I I I still have a great deal of faith in the uh, in the institution of journalism, uh, although it's certainly changing. Uh, and adapting, and while I applaud the notion of more citizen involvement and more unmediated communication, I don't think that's a reliable uh, form of our, our democratic exchange, and I worry a little bit that it's often kind of just a catchword for a weakened, and I'll agree with Bud, uh, a weakened uh, media, a, we a weakened news organization. Uh, take it in a little bit different direction. Um, I think everyone would agree that uh, one of the central challenges for our democracy in the United States going forward is uh, how this relationship that the nation as a whole has uh, to Islam is going to progress. And uh, Bob, you brought up Libya and uh, the events unfolding in that region now. And, and also you brought up earlier the connection between race and religion with Jeremiah Wright and that situation. And I, I wonder if you might talk a little bit about what's going on you know, in, in your home state of New York. You've got a representative from Long Island, Peter King, who's holding <laughs> um, hearings on American Muslims right now. So I wonder if you might say a bit about that. Sure. Um, this is exactly the area where more than ever we need civil and reasoned debate because these are such uh, complicated issues and in many cases the stakes are so high. Um, you know, the September 11th attacks, um, I live on the Upper West Side of Manhattan and my wife runs a foundation, she, she works on Wall Street, so she was walking distance. Um, she wasn't in her office, thank goodness, when the attacks happened, but she was, her office is walking distance from the site of the World Trade Center. So we hardly take the attacks of September 11th, um, you know, we take it very, very, very seriously. Um, and so the concerns are, as everybody here knows, completely understandable. That's the reason why we stand in those lines at the airport and, and you know, go through the hassle and, and all that sort of thing. So I don't, you know, nobody wants to minimize the threat of terror attacks. Um, and so it's because people feel so strongly about these things and because the issue is so real that when you get into uh, the other aspects of, you know, whether there ought to be a mosque or how congressional hearings, if we're going to have them, ought to be conducted and um, how we should um, talk about, 
issues where feelings on one side or another run so high, uh, where there is a danger of um, making mistakes and of um, um, citing people um, who are innocent improperly. All these issues are terribly, terribly, terribly complex. So we need to be able to have forums where we can talk about them and exchange our views in a, in a reasonable and um, uh, helpful way. And those are the forums that I don't see. Um, if you run a, a congressional hearing in a political uh, way um, where, you know, the situation is staged and stacked and, you know, people in Congress we've seen again and again and again at political hearings put Peter King aside. We've seen again and again where they make their statements and they try to score political points and they're interested in their FaceTime on TV and all that sort of thing. Well, that doesn't really get us anywhere. So I think that we need to figure out a way as a society how we can have conversations in this country about these terribly complex issues and what the media will be for those conversations. Is it going to be on television? Is it going to be on cable television? Uh, is there a way um, in the um, uh, digital media where you can really get all kinds of people to pay close attention, but you do have enough time and enough voices that we can get varying points of view uh, where the people are contributing in a way where, where these are individuals of goodwill and not just ideologues shrieking and screaming at one another. Uh, these are terribly complex issues, but we're in a, a, a moment in history in this country where we have to figure out what we're going to do about these issues and how we're going to keep the public properly informed as opposed to just generally misinformed. Um, I think a forum like this tonight is extremely important and I would like to see um, uh, something like this um, just replicated. I would like to be able to see Americans hear a variety of sane voices, but also be able to make themselves, make their own views known in a, in a sane and reasonable way. This is tough, but we need to work on this. We've got to get there. Mindy, do you think that the digital media can play a positive role in this kind of debate, or is it really, is it is it limited to the kind of shrieking that well, Bob? <clears throat> I, I would just make a point and I would preface it by saying just because something is the way it is today doesn't mean it will be tomorrow, to Bud's point, even when it's scientifically sound. But when I look at today and I look at America, particularly compared to, frankly, what we see happening in Tunisia and Egypt and Libya and the Middle East and Northern Africa and who knows how many more other countries are going to come afterwards, um, I would ask, let's, let's put it in perspective. We're the civility, the level of civility in America versus what we're seeing in those countries is actually pretty high. And, and I'm not trying to, to sugarcoat it or to say that it's enough. I think we always want to improve and it should be the nature of our country to be looking to improve. But the, the, the I think sometimes, um, you know, I, we, we sit here and we were talking about how the lack of civility and how we've become more partisan and even, um, you know, um, Al pointed out that if you go back in history, there are certainly points where we were as partisan or more partisan, and yet we are extremely civil compared to other parts of the world. I'm not satisfied with that at a level. I just think it's important to point out that the, the, the forces of freedom we have here, and one of them, for example, would be an open internet, the ability, you know, freedom of the press, freedom of speech, freedom of religion, um, What's, what's solidified in the Constitution leads to a level of civility that, that we enjoy that, that others don't. So, as, and then in terms of the internet specifically, I think that we saw, um, again, in, with, in the situations in Tunisia and Egypt and Libya, Libya, just how powerful a force the internet is for freedom and democracy and for free expression in that it was one of the, 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 the governments, the powerful in those countries, moved to shut it down because they saw how much it was it was propagating freedom 
in those countries, and it was it was advancing challenges to, to their power. So in my mind, there's no greater evidence to how the internet and technology is a force for freedom. And it's it's not, again, just because it's the internet or because it's technology, it's because it's open and because the barriers have been broken down. And that's why you know, I like to refer to it now as, as open media, because it's allowed anybody to express themselves and that's, that's critical to democracy. Could I, excuse me, could I just make a point here? Um, because I think this is important to understand. Um, this is a great country with a tremendous amount of freedom, probably more freedom than any other country on earth. So the point that I want to make is that, I mean, I get to write a column for a great newspaper and, and, and say what I think and feel. The point that I want to make is that we want to use these fabulous resources and this freedom that we have in the United States to the greatest extent that we can so what I would like to see is to have a public in the United States better informed. I'm not opposed to partisanship. I mean, I, th I just think that partisanship is the, is the nature of the beast. I mean, that's why we have elections. I mean, you have you know, Democrats, Republicans, or, or whomever. So partisanship in and of itself is not a problem. Incivility is a problem, but partisanship uh, is not a problem. But the important thing is um, not partisanship, but whether the public is well informed and then you leave it up to the public to make their decisions, you get better decisions if the public is better informed. So I don't want the benchmark to be Egypt under Mubarak or I don't want it to be um, Libya or, you know, I, I, I want the benchmark to be where we are in the United States of America right now. Let's, let's keep the bar there far higher than other places but then I would like to see the bar raised from where it is in, in, in the United States. Uh, you know. So the idea that we're better off than Libya is under Muammar Gaddafi, I think goes without saying. My point, uh, that was not the point that I'm trying to make. I'm trying to say that the United States of America, um, as wonderful as, um, the fr as wonderful as the freedoms are that we have now, and as vast as the free media are that we have now, I would like to see it used to better effect. And I agree with that. I would just make one comment. So, you know, we are at the point when I was made the point about the last 10 years being about the advent of content and of information and the next 10 years being about filtering. And of course, that's simplifying it. I, I wasn't even implying that it has to be self-directed filters, that we each are, we only are relying on individuals to be their own filter. It's, it's devising a system that filters the information in a way um, where it is useful and where it is honest and where it is true and where it is factual. And I, I do believe though that system will look very different than the systems in the past. And I don't even, I don't know exactly what that looks like and that's the nature of this conversation here today. Here today. I'm gonna a segue from that actually. We, we have some time set aside for Q&A so if anyone in the audience has a question for any of the panelists, there's a mic right up here, and if I just ask you to um, step towards that mic, and you can line up if, if, if you like. Um, sir, if you wanna go ahead and start us off. Sure. Um, fascinating, thank you very much for your thoughtful ideas. There's one thing that is, that keeps coming back, putting the fifth estate aside. Uh, I mean, in the old days, there was poetry, theater, uh, stand-up comics, uh, political satire. So there's always been ways for people to express their uh, different views outside of the media. And as, you, as we've heard, always been polarization. That is not the issue. The issue is why the mainstream media not educating and informing, as we just heard, the public. And let's not blame anything uh, about social media. Uh, social media is wonderful. It is going, nobody knows where it's going, but this does not take away the responsibility from the media. Let me, let me give you an example. Every day there is a White House press conference. It is not the bloggers who are asking those questions and directing the debate. For example, forcing a president to make a comment on something that really should not even be discussed, uh, frankly. Uh, why, for example, we don't get 
the media doesn't try to get to the average American, always thinking that, oh, maybe they're not interested. They're not interested, they're not interested. Well, that is not true. The problem is that the media, mainstream media, and probably now has the best opportunity to really come back much stronger by truly focusing on providing meaningful information. Take, for example, the financial crisis. Why hasn't anyone told the average American what was happening with the wealth that was being creating, uh, created by China, India, you know, Brazil, the oil producing countries, putting so much pressure on the dollar that financial institutions were pressured to place the dollar somehow, and then related to why they could not get their credit when they went to the bank. So people will start becoming more educated and understand that what happens around the world does affect them directly. But nobody did the case. I mean, and it's easy to explain. It does, you don't have to talk about the esoteric derivatives, for God's sake. It can be done, but nobody's doing it. And let's not blame social media. So my question is, what can be done? We are here at a wonderful university, great um, school. What can really be done to get mainstream media to focus on educating the public? Thank you. Um, I happen to think this is just one idea, and there are, I hope, many out there. But I happen to think that television remains the most powerful medium for um, informing the public about the issues of the day. Um, network television and, and the main cable um, networks are um, focused on the bottom line. Uh, and there's, I don't see how you change that. But just look at the explosion of coverage of Charlie Sheen lately. I mean, it has just been insanity. I turn on the Today Show, Charlie Sheen. I turn on Nightly News, Charlie Sheen. CNN, Charlie Sheen. I can't believe it, you know? I don't watch the entertainment channels, or I know that they must be, you know. So what I would like to see, and I don't know how one could set this up, it would cost an awful lot of money. You need resources. But I would like to see um, one or two cable channels devoted to serious news, discussion, and commentary, kept on, a, on a, um, a reasonably high level to a very high level. Um, no shrieking, no histrionics, uh, no gruesome sensationalism. I think it can be done in a way that is interesting. It doesn't have to be so dull that it makes you keel over and go to sleep. I think the stories themselves can be compelling enough, if they're done right, to get people to pay attention. Um, I would like to see this happen. I don't know if it would require, um, you know, uh, angels with large pockets. I don't know if um, if there is a way to to get subscription services to contribute. I don't know if you could ultimately get advertising for it, but it would be an honest channel. Uh, with an honest effort to inform the public in a reasonable and, and robust way. TV is the medium that has both the reach and, and the power to do that. Okay. Yeah, uh, uh, I'll, let me turn to your question around. Um, actually, television does, is the main medium in America, still reaches, 70% of us still get most of our news from television. But I would turn it around. We wanted, you want media to do better. We need to do a lot better with media literacy education. We need to develop through our schools, and you specifically talk about Wall Street. Well, financial literacy is a serious problem. If you don't have an audience that won't demand it, then the, since we have a commercial media, it's not going to be incentivized to do it. So I, I think in these, this world of, of testing in our high schools and, 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 a, and a distinct drop in civic education and media literacy, that if you want to think about how you turn it around, you can, of course, 
argue or shout at the, at the media. So the media tends to respond to audiences, just like they respond for political reasons, for partisanship and the things that I mentioned. So I think that's uh, something that we can do both in, uh, both in universities and on the, in secondary education to do a lot better preparing Americans to understand what media is and how to consume it and how to do the filter that Wendy talked about. If I could take one shot at that question too. Um, on the point of the media as educators, uh, that's been an internal debate within the journalism fraternity for decades. Um, it was best summed up in my opinion in a few words by a great early science writer who worked in this town, uh, Victor Cohn, the late Victor Cohn, uh, who died, he was with the Washington Post. Before that, he had been at the New York Times, and before that, the Detroit Free Press. But Victor always said, um, journalists educate, but we're not educators. And I think there's a lot to that, to that comment. I think journalists are comfortable with the verb that they educate. I don't think most of us are comfortable with the noun that we're educators. Um, it's in a real ripple effect through the journalism community when the New York Times company, I don't know, Bob, was it eight or 10 years ago, bought about.com. Because when they bought about.com, that seemed to sim symbolize for many that, aha, the mainstream media recognize they have an educational responsibility. The second point I'd like to make in response to your question is, we need to find a way to put a value on good journalism. We do not have a business plan that, that carries out good journalism means good quarterly returns for stockholders. We do not have a way of valuing good journalism. Frankly, journalism graduates at the bachelor's degree level are still among the lowest paid going into their first, first career jobs. The news media for many years have been unable to put a price on their good journalism. We know it costs a lot to do the kind of story that the Washington Post did on, at Walter Reed. We know that's expensive to do that kind of story. But the Post won five Pulitzer Prizes that year and lost 100,000 daily subscribers. So it is, it is very difficult in our society to put a fair price on quality journalism. We haven't found a way to do it. And that's part of the equation, I think. previous uh, question was kind of what I had in mind, but I actually have a couple of questions for Mindy and for uh, Bud. Uh, Mindy, you, you worked on the Rom Romney campaign, and uh, from your perspective, um, <clears throat> it might sound like a simplistic question, but you know, a lot of conversations that you hear on TV, you watch Fox News, you watch MSNBC, and you know, they sort of accuse each other of being partisan, but you know, from your perspective, and I'm sure you, you being on the campaign had to be involved in a lot of conversations with the media, how much the media is is clearly um, divided on the on you know between Republicans and, and Democrats, and there's a sort of a preset agenda there. Because in my mind, you know, we talk about you know the fourth media and then the fifth media, and we talk about the fact that um, you know the, the new type of media is sort of unfiltered, needs a lot of filtering, and it, you know there, there seems to be a lot of reaction to what could not be said um, in the sort of existing traditional uh, media, and, and that's sort of coming out from that way. And it seems to me that more so than, you know, medias have their own focus to entertain and bring, you know, audience to watch them, but there's also a sense that, um, you know, they have a preset idea of what their interests are. And they're not just involved in journalism, they're also involved in different other aspects of business, and therefore they have to promote certain ideals. So it's not always trying to respond to uh, you know, the New York Times wrote a piece on Walter Reed or, or what have you, said the Washington Post, I think. But it didn't, I mean, that's an example of you shouldn't do this because you'll, you, you'll lose some of your readership. But a lot of times, you're sort of actually playing the leadership role in making a decision um, on, of what you want to educate uh, people, and, you know, more so than, than what you've described as in terms of just sharing what you know and not playing the leadership role in educating people. So that's my first question. And... My second question to uh, Bud, I work in uh, the transportation industry and I mean, climate change is a big issue right now and the sense that we get in the industry is it's still at the, you know, for the lack of a better term, at the lip service sort of level. So, 
do you get a sense that there are serious and um, detailed studies that discuss, you know, not just in a big picture way, the vision level of we need to do this and we need to do that, but more implementation action items of what needs to be done um, in a cost benefit way to sort of address these issues moving forward in the next 10, 20, 30 years. Thank you. Sure. So in politics, we often talk about moderates, but there's, there's really, moderate can mean two different things. It can be moderate in belief and moderate in temperament. Moderate in belief is having beliefs on both sides. Moderate in temperament, maybe you have strong beliefs on one side, but you're not, um, you wouldn't be considered somebody who, who bickers or partisan or who shifts the debate recklessly in, in one direction. In media, we're, I think there's the same thing. We often talk about media needing to be objective, or I've heard the term serious, very often serious media, but then it was also raised that we need to have forums where there are many different opinions that are brought to the table. I think the challenge and the reason that there are now many different sources and some of them have gotten to the point of sensational is that um, objective for too long ended up being colorless or opinionless. And obviously there's the opinion pages and there was the opinion pages and there was the news pages. And so there were many individuals who looked at media that was apparently objective and they saw opinion and yet media would say, no, we're objective, we're serious journalists. And so rather than hiding it, you started to see opinion makers come out of the woodworks as, as journalists. And these lines are more blurred now between the, the opinion um, makers and the uh, opinion writers or opinion pundits on television and the newsmakers. And I actually heard Rachel Maddow speak about this a couple months ago. And uh, she was very critical, um, as you might expect in her position, of the old guard of journalists who decry the, uh, the, the journalism of today or the TV pundits um, for, for taking strong opinions or for being partisan. And her point, number one, was, which I agree with, was it's, it's no different than you know, every generation that decries these kids these days and their crazy music. It's, it's something mm -hmm. that happens, you know, this, this is a, it's, a, it's a reality. It's a phenomenon that we have to deal with, number one. But number two, her point, um, which I agree with, although I think there's, there's some hypocrisy when she made it, is that the, because she has an audience and she has a captive audience, it gives her a platform to talk about issues that may not be covered elsewhere. And in her mind are, are important issues. And so I, I'm not defending um, media, the, the state of media today and, and exactly the, the way it is, but I do think that there's, a, there's, there's something positive that's come from the fact that opinion journalism is considered serious journalism. And we, we may need to be more moderate in temperament, but I don't think we need to be more moderate in belief because real people, um, the, the people who are expressing opinions are expressing opinions just like every a regular individual does, just like everybody in this room has opinions. And I think it's okay, I, I think one shift that I would hope to see is that it is not expected that because someone has an opinion that may be on the right side of the fence or the left side of the fence on one issue, that they can't have opinions on the other side of the fence on another issue, because that's the way that real Americans behave as well. But. I'd like to briefly take a stab at the question you've directed to Mindy, uh, because I think that, um, you know, I, for years or decades, I guess, I've been called an environmental journalist. Um, the one thing I'm not is an environmentalist journalist. Uh, I would kill, I would kill for a great, well-reported, well-researched, well-edited, well-documented and illustrated, beautifully laid out feature story that PCBs or DDT are good for us. I would kill to have that story. That's above the fold, page one, that's a Pulitzer. If that can be done by the best journalistic standards, that's the one I want to do. I would kill to have that same story say that climate change is a farce, it's a hoax, and there's no science behind it. I'd love to have that story. So I'm much more a journalist uh, than I am interested in the environment. Um, a, a, another point, um, I think political journalists are much the same way. I think clearly they have preferences, but most of them, they love nothing more than a good story. And they're driven by that good story. And I think the best journalists are gonna follow that story, whether it helps or hurts their own personal preferences. 
for the environment or against the environment or for Democrats or against uh, Republicans or whatever. Uh, so I have a lot of confidence in that. Um, in terms of your question about uh, environment or, or climate change, um, you know, for, for a long time, um, I mean, we have this, these two strategies for addressing the challenges of climate change. One is mitigation, that is reduce greenhouse gases, and the other is adaptation, that is learn to adjust and live with, live with the changes that are already in the system that are inevitable already. Um, but for a long time, the activist community shunned the term mitigation because they thought that that meant, and it might well have meant, uh, we don't have to worry about adapting. We don't have to worry about CO2, let's just adapt, and we don't, uh, we don't have to mitigate. Um, I think given the direction that the international community and the U.S. certainly have gone the past year or so, we're going to see much more favoritism toward ad adaptation as, uh, if you will, an essential part of the strategy. Uh, so I think that's one thing. The problem we're going to face is that as newsrooms continue to pare down their reporting staffs, uh, we're going to find more GA, more general assignment reporters having to go through the same learning curve that the best science and environmental reporters have gone through over the past two decades. So they're probably going to be tempted to go with this false balance of, you know, the Surgeon General says tobacco will kill you, Tobacco Institute says everything's fine. Uh, well, well that's, um, that's balance, but it's not accuracy. Balance can be the enemy of accuracy. I think we've seen that, that in the climate change field in journalism, we saw it up until a few years ago, and I fear as more GAs come in and more of the seasoned veteran science writers are phased out because of the higher salaries and approaching pensions and everything else, um, we're, gonna, we're gonna have to relearn some of those same things. So I'm a little bit bearish on that. The young woman here. This will be the last question. Thank you. Um, I noticed a common thread in some of the comments um, about uh, more of a call for journalism, serious journalism in the public interest. Um, Bob Herbert said that he would like to see one or two channels devoted to serious discussion. And uh, Bud talked about the fact that we need to really put a, find a way to put a value on good journalism. And we used to have something that we talked about about journalism in the public interest, and we used to believe that really public broadcasting, the public broadcasting service, filled an important need and would fulfill that goal and that need. And yet, we're right now, we're talking about the need for more serious journalism in the public interest. At the same time, we're sort of not talking about a crisis in public broadcasting. And this, we did allude briefly to the fact, um, a move to defund public broadcasting. And do you see, are any of you concerned about that? Or are we sort of just looking for an alternative beyond that? Uh, I am concerned about it. Um, I think it's outlandish um, if if we were to go ahead and make make it more difficult for um, you know public television and public uh, radio to do the job that they've been doing. But I think that um, given the realities of politics and the importance of the issues facing the country, that we have to come up with ways of keeping the public um, well informed um, that's not at the mercy or, or the, the whim of um, politics. Um, and so, you know, I'd like to see um, uh, public, public te television and radio continue and I'd like to see it thrive. But I also think that we need um, other, outlets, uh, other outlets as well. I'll uh, take a swing at that one, too. I, I, I agree with Bob. Uh, I'm not a great fan of state media, state-owned media. Right. And uh, where I think public broadcasting has certainly filled an important niche is certainly education and cultural. Uh, and the public affairs programs are, are by and large, professional and good, they don't have a lot of reach, you know. They don't have, now NPR has a big reach, uh, 25 million uh, reach. Uh, NPR can do without the, the, the small amount of subsidy they get and still being a flourishing organization and actually might get them out from under the hammer that they're under now, largely because of perceptions 
the problem is in the local level, so in lo the local stations, both in radio and, and, and television, uh, who frankly have, uh, who've, who function, many of them are owned by universities and nonprofits. So they can need to just pick up some of the slack uh, and make them more vital organizations. Um, so I don't, a number of people in the, in the great financial crisis we've had with, the, with journalism in the last two years have kind of looked to and said, well, the, re the response should be a greater investment in state media, st in, in publicly, in PBS and whatever. Uh, and the oftentimes scholars will point out the European model. Um, I, I'm highly skeptical of that as a solution in our system. I'll, I'll actually offer a, maybe a concluding thought. Um, we've talked a lot about the responsibilities of the media, uh, both the fourth and the fifth estate media, but I think clearly we get the democracy that we deserve. And um, that's, I think, uh, something that speaks well to all of you, and it's uh, part of why we're so proud to be holding an event like this and be partnering um, with the Justice Columbia Lodge number three, and, um, and we're so grateful for our panelists being here. We hope you'll look out for the next in the series of events, and we hope you'll also find other ways to pursue this topic on your own and to maybe spin off events, as Bob suggested, that, uh, that have this same kind of character. So thank you all once again for joining us tonight, and have a good night.